So hi, so I'm Remy Philip. I'm, I'm, I work uh, at STEM as a TME in, uh, in INSBU, and I'm going to walk you through all the telemetry parts and the context information, the pipeline around iteration in this release. So if you think we covered a bit uh, of, uh, of this information in the questions, the idea of the of the packet collection, right? So when, when we go, if we imagine this is a this is a, a packet flow just through between the between two applications. The way we collect and monitor information today is a lot around this. We take accumulated flow information and then we do a bit of math around it uh, to get out and derive a min, a max, an average. But the problem is that the granularity of this information is really dependent of, of the export interval. If you can't get the window of the export, you, you don't know exactly what data you've collected for how long. So typically, if I imagine a packet, a flow, sorry, the average packet size is 1,500 bytes, and then just one packet went out at 9,000, but I have 1 million packets in this interval, well, my average is probably 1,500 still. But so no one will know that something has happened in this flow. So the idea we had is to say, hey, if we want to see every single uh, details on a packet, we need to be able to export every single packet. But we need to do it in a smart enough way to not double up the bandwidth. Not to say it might be useful for Cisco, we could sell more switches, but I think many customers will be very, very unhappy with this approach. So what we did is say, we're going to take every packet, we're going to measure them, and we're doing an equivalent kind of a diff between every single packet. And we're just going to export differences around everything. So it means that, for example, if all those packets were 1,500, uh, or sorry, those packets were 66, and then I have one packet going up to 9,000, uh, then that would raise uh, that I know that, hey, all the packets were fine, working well up to now. Then I got a 9,000 packet, byte packet there. Is it normal? Is it not normal? Then after you can do the analysis, but at least you know. And when we do that for every parameter we actually collect inside it without ever sampling. So actually, correct. We can sample only in a case where you decide not to allocate resources on the, uh, on the server. That's, that's the only reason. But you're aware of it, and we do send warnings and things like that. In terms of the what, um, there's, a, there's a few elements around it. And fortunately, we, we cannot give you the full list right now. Just because we need, legal has to say, yes, you can share it as usual. So we're just waiting for them to confirm. But in terms of information, we're looking for things like distributions, uh, uh, packet size, latency, window sizes, and things like that that, that are flowing through the, the system. We're looking at the burstiness of a flow. So let's say a flow was silent for one hour, then burst up to um, 10 gig, then silent again for one minute, burst again. You need to be able to have this behavior of the flow inside it to be able to say, yeah, normal, abnormal, I need to change something, or anything like that. We do collect information as well with regards to anomaly detection. So typically, those are very basic anomalies that we're tracking there, like you know, kind of the Christmas flag, Christmas packets, those kind of things. So really, more basic kind of uh, information there. Uh, we don't really use it today. Huh? That's more for future usage around the platform. So latency, Tim talked uh, through that. Application latency. So how long did an application take to respond to a request? So we track at the network level uh, what's happening in the flow. We understand, hey, this packet was there and was requesting data. This is the packet was actually responding with data to this request. So that's why we have lots of machine learning around that. You can actually figure out that it's the slow database and not the network. Exactly. OK, <laughs> finally. <laughs> Uh, how do you persuade the database administrator that your data is correct? That's always the, that's indeed, the, it's a very good question. We don't, we don't have a magic answer to that. Uh, um, usually, uh, what we've seen is that each time that we see the application spike, and we have a second graph that will show you the latency of the network, so it's like, hey, sorry, but it's like, it's pretty obvious the problem is at the application level. Like, I, I can't do anything more from my end. And you can show the two graphs. So we do put all the graphs on the same display and the same scale. So you see, for example, uh, uh, and we see that in our VMware environment because we, uh, like, of course, it's a lab, so it's highly oversubscribed. And sometimes you see the application latency spike to one second uh, when the network is very low, uh, just because people are spinning off new VMs uh, and things like that. So we do see that very well uh, in our lab environment. 
IG as well, actually. And so sorry, other information we get is a VX line information. So again, we don't really use them today neither, but we have the capability uh, in our A6 uh, to go and look inside uh, the, the VX line to get the inner headers information there. So if you run full overlay, uh, we'll have the capability in the A6 to be able to go and check what's going on inside it, as long as it's not encrypted, of course. But that's, encryption is more of a corner case right now in VX line. So is this is this true for which kind of headers? GRE, VXLAN? Right now, it's really VXLAN that we're targeting. I'm not sure for GRE. I haven't tested it. I don't know if you did. So I couldn't confirm for GRE. VXLAN for sure. GRE, we need to check. But you said that this is for future. We don't use it today. It works, but we don't use it. If I, if you capture in the center of ACI fabric, for example where it's only VXLAN, you can't see anything. If you, if at the spine level, if you capture, yes. Yeah. But we didn't enable the agents on the spines. <laughs> ah, okay. Uh, or put another way, if someone is running NSX on top of your network, all you see is IP traffic. You can't go and inspect the That's correct. VM traffic yet. So the VM traffic, it's a yes and no. It depends where you put the sensor. So if you put the sensor at the VM, you're fine. Uh, if you put it only at the network, yes, indeed, we cannot look into the VXLAN today. But you could, theoretically. You, we could. The hardware is there. The hardware is there. Uh, it actually works today. Like We've tested it. We know it works. Um, then after, you know, there's the hardware, then there's the software layer, then there's the collector layer. So that's where we're just prioritizing the features based on the asks. That's, uh, that's all. That's so why we have a RPM sitting in the back to make sure that he can hear all this information. <laughs> in terms of, uh, of export rate as well, um, you see that it's pretty fast. And those are capabilities wise. GSIC is capable of actually, GSIC could export it way faster than that, but it's just, you couldn't build a platform that could take all the events uh, together. So 100 milliseconds is good. Today we use even one second interval for the DA hardware because it's configurable, uh, just makes more sense. Server, like ser server, sorry. A software sensor is kind of easier. We have a bit more memory so we can store more information before we export. Now the extra information is what we're talking about. So that's kind of all what I've talked about is first is the base, is the base flow information. We take it from a network angle and so on, but really, the point is this network information, I won't say is useless, but at some point, if you don't have any context around it and you're using microservices, for example, and you have IP1 running microservice A and half an hour later, this IP address with the same port is running microservice B, you, you don't really know that. So is it a problem right now? No, because not too, much, too many microservices exist in the future. Well, maybe. So what we're trying to do is that for every single of those flows, uh, we want to add some extra context around it. So we want to say that, hey, this is the process that's running it. This process is owned by this user. And at the network level, I'm getting extra information. So for, exa for example, sorry, um, how, what's my buffer status around those? And so you get more and more and more context around it, and we annotate them. And this is not a finite uh, amount of information, actually. That it's, technically unlimited uh, there, because the way we process it is we take five tuples being the key, um, and then after we start adding extra tags on the five tuples and so on. So basically, our limit would be the storage uh, of the platform at some point. And this kind of information can be augmented because as we're talking about tags, but some things you upload as well uh, there. And what we're trying to get to is to a point where you know when an, an application is in production or not, or you know which uh, group owns an application. You have an idea if it's on AWS or in Azure or whatever, and you might want to do different actions depending on where it sits. So what you can do is you define as many fields. So you define your fields uh, uh, right now up to 32 uh, that, you, uh, that you want to add on that, and then after you can populate this information with the flows. So for example, Let's say that you want to have the AWS and you know that your VPC is on the subnet 10.0 or uh, something. You can say all hosts uh, that are matching the 10.0 subnet add the tag AWS. All hosts that are 10.0, for example, or and I don't know, um, odd number of IP addresses, add them as, uh, as uh, AWS West or something like that. So you could decide what kind of data you're annotating and how you annotate. And all this after, uh, 
of course, you can kind of you can use it on the platform in the search queries. Uh, the 32 tags you have there, it looks like a bitmap of with 32 bits. Yes, and if it was a bitmap, it would be kind of limited to one byte bit, sorry, and which <laughs> which is not great. No, that, so the question really is: is this limited somewhere internally, architecturally, or is this just well convenience limit for today? <laughs> It's, uh, yeah, it's basically customer demand. Is like we started, uh, I, the initial one uh, when we wrote was like 15, uh, and then after I said 15 is too low, so okay, so what shall we put 30? Uh, like, yeah, 30 is okay, so then after, uh, yeah, we have a bunch of engineers, so they don't know how to count by 10, so they count immediately 32. And most likely the next step is not going to be 48, but it's going to be 64, because it's just going to go up uh, and in those ranges there. That's, uh, architecturally, uh, there's no, uh, no limitation. That like we can add as many as we want. It's just each time you add, you add a bit more storage on the platform. That's that's all. So then after, sorry, after you can do all your search filters. You can do as you want. An endpoint can be part of multiple groups. So for example, we got the Linux here, the Windows. Uh, uh, but these ones, for example, are running uh, um, Linux or Windows, sorry, and a web server. Just confused one minute. <laughs> on that, so you can do all the kind of filterings uh, that you want around it. And you can as well uh, filter inside a group. So if you want to get a subset of a group, you can go as well uh, at this level. And all these are features actually of, um, of the platform, the, sorry, the new release uh, that's actually uh, going to ship in March, April timeframe. Check in and get, keep an eye there. So maybe one question, the, uh, I don't know if I missed that or whatever, but the filters, they are, uh, the filters are dynamic or static? For example, can you say up front that these, these, and these subnets correspond to this data center and it will automatically, automatically tag anything which is created? Yes, that's correct. Okay. So you say, you specify, all this is actually, all this is driven by API as well. So it means like, for example, if you decide to change tags, uh, all the flows that come in from the moment you change, change as well. Okay. So say 1008 is data center one, and then I'm going to annotate automatically all the flows that are coming with 1008, then you can do it. That's fine. So it's completely, uh, completely automated uh, at this point. So from a view, uh, and I'll go there, upload uh, is kind of the kind of, these are the fields available. So how did we get there? We, uh, we posted a, J a JSON file. It came up with those tags uh, that are available. Then I can select or deselect uh, uh, information in there as I want. That's kind of my options there. So for example, in this one, let's focus on lifecycle, uh, which is just going to be production, dev, or whatever in this environment. From there, you can create filters. And the filters are in the idea of to be as close as we can be uh, to human language. That's, that's the idea around it. So it's still not perfect, but let's say if you're looking for uh, all the, the service which are in, in uh, for example, in production. <coughs> yeah, production. Then after you can add as many as you want in, for example, um, I don't know, which is a, a, a service could be um, web servers, for example. That's, a, that's how you define queries. So it's a, it is pretty easy there and you can go and create as many as you want kind of in terms of queries there. And that's going to look for the intersection of every, uh, every data across the platform.